You fool! Warren is dead. Welcome to Horror Babble. I'm pleased to return today with another Clark Ashton Smith Hyperborea story. The Testament of Athamouse, first published in the October 1932 edition of Weird Tales. The state executioner's story of an incredible monstrosity that struck terror to an entire city. We hope you enjoy this one. The Testament of Athamouse by Clark Ashton Smith 1. It has become needful for me, who am no wielder of the stylus of bronze or the pen of calamus, and whose only proper tool is the long, double-handed sword, to indict this account of the curious and lamentable happenings which foran the universal desertion of Camorium. By its king and its people. This I am well fitted to do, for I played a signal part in these happenings, and I left the city only when all the others had gone. Now Camorium, as every one knows, was aforetime the resplendent, high-built capital, and the marble and granite crown of all Hyperborea. But concerning the cause of its abandonment, there are now so many warring legends and so many tales of a false and fabulous character, that I, who am old in years and triply old in honours, I, who have grown weary with no less than eleven lustrums of public service, am compelled to write this record of the truth, ere it fade utterly from the tongues and memories of men. And this I do— though the telling thereof will include a confession of my one defeat, my one failure, in the dutiful administration of a committed task. For those who will read the narrative in future years, and haply in future lands, I shall now introduce myself. I am Athamouse, the chief headsman of Azuldarum, who held formerly the same office in Camorium. My father, Manghai Thal, was headsman before me, and the sires of my father, even to the mythic generations of the primal kings, have wielded the great copper sword of justice on the block of Igonwood. Forgive an aged man if he seemed to dwell, as is the habit of the old, among the youthful recollections that have gathered to themselves the kingly purple of removed horizons, and the strange glory that illumines irretrievable things. Lo, I am made young again when I recall Camorium, when in this grey city of the sunken years I behold in retrospect her walls that looked mountainously down upon the jungle, and the alabastrine multitude of her heaven-fretting spires, opulent among cities, and superb and magisterial, and paramount over all was Camorium, to whom tribute was given from the shores of the Atlantean Sea to that See in which is the immense continent of Mu, to whom the traders came from utmost Thulan, that is walled on the north with unknown ice, and from the southern realm of Shovulpanomi, which ends in a lake of boiling asphaltum. Ah, proud and lordly was Camorium, and her humblest dwellings were more than the palaces of other cities. And it was not, as men fable nowadays, because of that maundering prophecy once uttered by the white Sibyl from the Isle of Snow, which is named Pelerian, that her splendour and spaciousness were delivered over to the spotted vines of the jungle and the spotted snakes. Nay, it was because of a direr thing than this, and a tangible horror against which the law of kings, the wisdom of hierophants, and the sharpness of swords were alike impotent. Ah, not lightly was she overcome, not easily were her defenders driven forth, and though others forget, or haply deem her no more than a vain and dupitable tale, I shall never cease to lament Camorium. My sinews have dwindled grievously now, and time has drunken stealthily from my veins, and has touched my hair with the ashes of suns extinct. But in the days whereof I tell— 
There was no braver and more stalwart headsman than I in the whole of Hyperborea, and my name was a red menace, a loudly spoken warning to the evildoers of the forest and the town, and the savage robbers of uncouth outland tribes. Wearing the blood-bright purple of my office, I stood each morning in the public square, where all might attend and behold, and performed for the edification of all men my allotted task. And each day the tough, golden, ruddy copper of the huge crescent blade was darkened not once but many times with a rich and wine-like sanguine. And because of my never-faltering arm, my infallible eye, and the clean blow which there was never any necessity to repeat, I was much honoured by the king Luquamethros, and by the populace of Camorium. I remember well, on account of their more than unique atrocity, the earliest rumours that came to me in my active life regarding the outlaw, Nigathin Zorm. This person belonged to an obscure and highly unpleasant people called the Vormis, who dwelt in the black Iglophian mountains at a full day's journey from Camorium, and inhabited, according to their tribal custom, the caves of ferine animals less savage than themselves, which they had slain or otherwise dispossessed. They were generally looked upon as more beast-like than human, because of their excessive hairiness and the vile, ungodly rites and usages to which they were addicted. It was mainly from among these beings that the notorious Nigathin Zorm had recruited his formidable band, who were terrorizing the hills subjacent to the Iglophian mountains with daily deeds of the most infamous and iniquitous rapine. Wholesale robbery was the least of their crimes, and mere anthropophagism was far from being the worst. It will readily be seen from this that the Vormis were a somewhat aboriginal race, with an ethnic heritage of the darkest and most revolting type, and it was commonly said that Nigathin Zorm himself possessed an even murkier strain of ancestry than the others, being related on the maternal side to that queer non-anthropomorphic god Sathagua, who was worshipped so widely during the subhuman cycles. And there were those who whispered of even stranger blood, if one could properly call it blood, and a monstrous linkage with the swart, protean spawn that had come down with Sathagua from elder worlds and exterior dimensions where physiology and geometry had both assumed an altogether inverse trend of development. And because of this mingling of ultracosmic strains, it was said that the body of Nagath and Zoom, unlike his shaggy, amber-coloured fellow tribesmen, was hairless from crown to heel, and was pied with great spots of black and yellow. And moreover, he himself was reputed to exceed all others in his cruelty and cunning. For a long time, this execrable outlaw was no more to me than a horrific name, but inevitably I thought of him with a certain professional interest. There were many who believed him invulnerable by any weapon, and who told of his having escaped in a manner which none could elucidate, from more than one dungeon whose walls were not to be scaled or pierced by mortal beings. But of course I discounted all such tales, for my official experience had never yet included any one with properties or abilities of a like sort, and I knew well the superstitiousness of the vulgar multitude. From day to day new reports reached me, amid the preoccupations of never-slighted duty. This noxious marauder was not content with the seemingly ample sphere of operations afforded by his native mountains and the outlying hill regions with their fertile valleys and well-peopled towns. His forays became bolder and more extensive, till one night he descended on a village so near Camorium that it was usually classed as a suburb. Here— he and his filthy crew committed numerous deeds of an unspecifiable enormity, and bearing with them many of the villagers for purposes even less designable, they retired to their caves in the glassy-walled Iglophian peaks ere the ministers of justice could overtake them. It was this audaciously offensive act which prompted the law to exert its full power and vigilance 
against Nagath and Zorm. Before that, he and his men had been left to the local officers of the countryside. But now his misdeeds were such as to demand the rigorous attention of the constabulary of Camorium. Henceforth all his movements were followed as closely as possible. The towns where he might descend were strictly guarded, and traps were set everywhere. Even thus, Nagath and Zorm contrived to evade capture for month after month, and all the while he repeated his far-flung raids with an embarrassing frequency. It was almost by chance, or through his own foolhardiness, that he was eventually taken in broad daylight on the highway near the city's outskirts. Contrary to all expectation, in view of his renowned ferocity, he made no resistance whatever— but finding himself surrounded by mailed archers and bell-bearers, he yielded to them at once with an oblique, enigmatic smile, a smile that troubled for many nights thereafter the dreams of all who were present. For reasons which were never explained, he was altogether alone when taken, and none of his fellows were captured, either coincidentally or subsequently. Nevertheless, there was much excitement and jubilation in Camorium, and every one was curious to behold the dreaded outlaw. More even than others, perhaps, I felt the stirrings of interest, for upon me, in due course, the proper decapitation of Nagath and Zorm would devolve. From hearing the hideous rumours and legends whose nature I have already outlined— I was prepared for something out of the ordinary in the way of a criminal personality. But even at first sight, when I watched him as he was borne to prison through a moiling crowd, Nagath and Zorm surpassed the most sinister and disagreeable anticipations. He was naked to the waist, and wore the fulvous hide of some long-haired animal which hung in filthy tatters to his knees. Such details, however— contributed little to those elements in his appearance which revolted and even shocked me. His limbs, his body, his lineaments were outwardly formed like those of aboriginal men. And one might even have allowed for this utter hairlessness, in which there was a remote and blasphemously caricatural suggestion of the shaven priest, and even the broad, formless mottling of his skin, like that of a huge boa, might somehow have been glossed over as a rather extravagant peculiarity of pigmentation. It was something else. It was the anxious, verminous ease, the undulant litheness and fluidity of his every movement, seeming to hint at an inner structure and vertebration that were less than human, or one might almost have said a subaphidian lack of all bony framework— which made me view the captive and also my incumbent task with an unparallelable distaste. He seemed to slither rather than walk, and the very fashion of his jointure, the placing of knees, hips, elbows, and shoulders, appeared arbitrary and factitious. One felt that the outward semblance of humanity was a mere concession to anatomical convention— and that his corporeal formation might easily have assumed, and might still assume at any instant, the unheard-of outlines and concept-defying dimensions that prevail in transgalactic worlds. Indeed, I could now believe the outrageous tales concerning his ancestry. And with equal horror and curiosity I wondered— what the stroke of justice would reveal, and what noisome, mephitic ichor would befoul the impartial sword in lieu of honest blood. It is needless to record in circumstantial detail the process by which Nagath and Zorm was tried and condemned for his manifold enormities. The workings of the law were implacably swift and sure, and their equity permitted of no quibbling or delay— the captive was confined in an oubliette below the main dungeons, a cell hewn in the basic Archean nice at a profound depth, with no entrance other than a hole through which he was lowered and drawn up by means of a long rope and windlass. This hole was lidded with a huge block, and was guarded day and night by a dozen men-at-arms. However, 
there was no attempt at escape on the part of Nagathan Zorm. Indeed, he seemed unnaturally resigned to his prospective doom. To me, who have always been possessed of a strain of prophetic intuition, there was something overtly ominous in this unlooked-for resignation. Also, I did not like the demeanour of the prisoner during his trial— the silence which he had preserved at all times following his capture and incarceration was still maintained before his judges, though interpreters who knew the harsh, sibilant Iglophian dialect were provided, he would make no answer to questions, and he offered no defence. Least of all did I like the unabashed and unblinking manner in which he received the final pronouncement of death which was uttered in the High Court of Camorium by eight judges in turn, and solemnly reaffirmed at the end by King Loquamethros. After that, I looked well to the sharpening of my sword, and promised myself that I would concentrate all the resources of a brawny arm and a flawless manual artistry upon the forthcoming execution. My task was not long deferred— for the usual interval of a fortnight between condemnation and decapitation had been shortened to three days, in view of the suspicious peculiarities of Nagathan Zorm and the heinous magnitude of his proven crimes. On the morning appointed, after a night that had been rendered dismal by a long-drawn succession of the most abominable dreams, I went with my unfailing punctuality to the block of Igonwood which was situated with geometrical exactness in the centre of the main square. Here a huge crowd had already gathered, and the clear amber sun blazed royally down on the silver and nacarat of court dignitaries, the hodden of merchants and artisans, and the rough pelts that were worn by outland people. With a like punctuality, Negathen Zorm soon appeared amid his entourage of guards, who surrounded him with a bristling hedge of billhooks and lances and tritons. At the same time, all the outer avenues of the city, as well as the entrances to the square, were guarded by massed soldiery, for it was feared that the uncaught members of the desperate outlaw band might make an effort to rescue their infamous chief at the last moment. Amid the unremitting vigilance of his warders, Nigathin Zorm came forward— fixing upon me the intent but inexpressive gaze of his lidless, ochre-yellow eyes, in which a face-to-face -face scrutiny could discern no pupils. He knelt down beside the block, presenting his mottled nape without a tremor. As I looked upon him with a calculating eye, and made ready for the lethal stroke, I was impressed more powerfully and more disagreeably than ever— by the feeling of a loathsome, underlying plasticity, an invertebrate structure, nauseous and non-terrestrial, beneath his impious mockery of human form. And I could not help perceiving also the air of abnormal coolness, of abstract, impenetrable cynicism, that was maintained by all his parts and members. He was like a torpid snake, or some huge liana of the jungle— that is wholly unconscious of the shearing axe. I was well aware that I might be dealing with things which were beyond the ordinary province of a public headsman, but nathless I lifted the great sword in a clean, symmetrically flashing arc, and brought it down on the piebald nape with all of my customary force and address. Necks differ in the sensations which they afford to one's hand beneath the penetrating blade. In this case, I can only say that the sensation was not such as I have grown to associate with the cleaving of any known animal substance. But I saw with relief that the blow had been successful. The head of Nagathan Zorm lay cleanly severed on the porous block and his body sprawled on the pavement without even a single quiver of departing animation. As I had expected, there was no blood, only a black, tarry, fetid exudation, far from copious, which ceased in a few minutes, and vanished utterly from my sword and from the Igon wood. Also, 
The inner anatomy which the blade had revealed was devoid of all legitimate vertebration, but to all appearance Nagathan's arm had yielded up his obscene life, and the sentence of King Loquamethros and the eight judges of Camorium had been fulfilled with a legal precision. Proudly but modestly, I received the applause of the waiting multitudes, who bore willing witness to the consummation of my official task, and were loudly jubilant over the dead scourge. After seeing that the remains of Nagathenzorm were given into the hands of the public gravediggers, who always disposed of such awful, I left the square and returned to my home, since no other decapitations had been set for that day. My conscience was serene, and I felt that I had acquitted myself worthily in the performance of a far from pleasant duty. Negathinzorm, as was the custom in dealing with the bodies of the most nefarious criminals, was interred with contumelious haste in a barren field outside the city, where people cast their oughts and rubbish. He was left in an unmarked and unmounded grave between two middens. The power of the law had now been amply vindicated, and every one was satisfied from Lokomethros himself, to the villagers that had suffered from the depredations of the deceased outlaw. I retired that night, after a bounteous meal of suvanna fruit and jongua beans, well irrigated with foom wine. From a moral standpoint, I had every reason to sleep the sleep of the virtuous. But even as on the preceding night, I was made the victim of one cacodemoniacal dream after another— of these dreams I recall only their pervading, unifying consciousness of insufferable suspense, of monotonously cumulative horror without shape or name, and the ever-torturing sentiment of vain repetition and dark, hopeless toil and frustration. Also, there is a half-memory, which refuses to assume any approach to visual form— of things that were never intended for human perception or human cognition, and the aforesaid sentiment and all the horror were dimly but indissolubly bound up with these. Awaking unrefreshed and weary from what seemed an eon of thankless endeavour, of treadmill bafflement, I could only impute my nocturnal sufferings to the jongua beans— and decided that I must have eaten all too liberally of these nutritious viands. Mercifully, I did not suspect in my dreams the dark, portentous symbolism that was soon to declare itself. Two. Now must I write the things that are formidable unto earth and the dwellers of earth— the things that exceed all human or terrene regimen, that subvert reason, that mock the dimensions and defy biology. Dire is the tale, and after seven lustrums the tremor of an olden fear still agitates my hand as I write. But of such things I was still oblivious when I sallied forth that morning to the place of execution— where three criminals of a quite average sort, whose very cephalic contours I have forgotten, along with their offences, were to meet their well-deserved doom beneath my capable arm. Howbeit I had not gone far, when I heard an unconscionable uproar that was spreading swiftly from street to street, from alley to alley, throughout Camorium. I distinguished a myriad cries of rage, horror, fear, and lamentation that was seemingly caught up and repeated by every one who chanced to be abroad at that hour. Meeting some of the citizenry, who were plainly in a state of the most excessive agitation, and were still continuing their outcries, I inquired the reason of all this clamour, and thereupon I learned from them that Nagathen Zorm, whose illicit career was presumably at an end, had now reappeared and had signalized the unholy miracle of his return by the commission of a most appalling act on the main avenue, before the very eyes of early passers. He had seized a respectable seller of jongua beans, 
and had proceeded instantly to devour his victim alive, without heeding the blows, bricks, arrows, javelins, cobblestones, and curses that were rained upon him by the gathering throng, and by the police. It was only when he had satisfied his atrocious appetite that he suffered the police to lead him away, leaving little more than the bones and raiment of the jongua cellar to mark the spot of this outrageous happening. Since the case was without legal parallel, Nagathanzorm had been thrown once more into the oubliette below the city dungeons, to await the will of Loquamethros and the eight judges. The exceeding discomfiture, the profound embarrassment felt by myself, as well as by the people and the magistracy of Camorium, can well be imagined. As every one bore witness— Nagathanzorm had been efficiently beheaded and buried according to the customary ritual, and his resurrection was not only against nature, but involved a most contumelious and highly mystifying breach of the law. In fact, the legal aspects of the case were such as to render necessary the immediate passage of a special statute, calling for rejudgment and allowing re-execution— of such malefactors as might thus return from their lawful graves. Apart from all this, there was general consternation, and even at that early date the more ignorant and more religious among the townsfolk were prone to regard the matter as an omen of some impending civic calamity. As for me, my scientific turn of mind, which repudiated the supernatural— led me to seek an explanation of the problem in the non-terrestrial side of Negathenzorm's ancestry. I felt sure that the forces of an alien biology, the properties of a transstellar life substance, were somehow involved. With the spirit of the true investigator, I summoned the gravediggers who had interred Negathenzorm, and bade them lead me to his place of sepulture in the refuse grounds. Here— a most singular condition disclosed itself. The earth had not been disturbed, apart from a deep hole at one end of the grave, such as might have been made by a large rodent. No body of human size, or at least of human form, could possibly have emerged from this hole. At my command, the diggers removed all the loose soil, mingled with potsherds and other rubbish, which they had heaped upon the beheaded outlaw. When they reached the bottom, nothing was found but a slight stickiness where the corpse had lain, and this, along with an odour of ineffable foulness which was its concomitant, soon dissipated itself in the open air. Baffled and more mystified than ever, but still sure that the enigma would permit of some natural solution, I awaited the new trial— this time, the course of justice was even quicker and less given to quibbling than before. The prisoner was again condemned, and the time of decapitation was delayed only till the following morn. A proviso concerning burial was added to the sentence. The remains were to be sealed in a strong wooden sarcophagus. The sarcophagus was to be inhumed in a deep pit in the solid stone, and the pit filled with massy boulders. These measures, it was felt, should serve amply to restrain the unwholesome and irregular inclinations of this obnoxious miscreant. When Negethin Zorm was again brought before me, amid a redoubled guard and a throng that overflowed the square and all of the outlying avenues, I viewed him with profound concern, and with more than my former repulsion. Having a good memory for anatomic details— I noticed some odd changes in his physique. The huge splotches of dull black and sickly yellow that had covered him from head to heel were now somewhat differently distributed. The shifting of the facial blotches around the eyes and mouth had given him an expression that was both grim and sardonic to an unbearable degree. Also, there was a perceptible shortening of his neck— though the place of cleavage and reunion, midway between head and shoulders, had left no mark whatever, and looking at his limbs, 
I discerned other and more subtle changes. Despite my acumen in physical matters, I found myself unwilling to speculate regarding the processes that might underlie these alterations. Still less did I wish to surmise the problematic results of their continuation, if such should ensue. Hoping fervently that Nagathan Zorm and the vile, flagitious properties of his unhallowed carcass would now be brought to a permanent end, I raised the sword of justice high in air and smote with heroic might. Once again, as far as mortal eyes were able to determine, the effects of the shearing blow were all that could be desired. The head rolled forward on the igon wood and the torso and its members fell and lay supinely on the maculated flags. From a legal viewpoint, this doubly nefarious malefactor was now twice dead. Howbeit, this time I superintended in person the disposal of the remains, and saw to the bolting of the fine sarcophagus of Afferwood in which they were laid, and the filling with chosen boulders of the ten-foot pit— into which the sarcophagus was lowered. It required three men to lift even the least of these boulders. We all felt that the irrepressible Nagathan Zorm was due for a quietus. Alas for the vanity of earthly hopes and labours! The morrow came with its unspeakable, incredible tale of renewed outrage. Once more the weird, semi-human offender was abroad. Once more his anthropophagic lust had taken toll from among the honourable denizens of Camorium. He had eaten no less a personage than one of the eight judges, and, not satisfied with picking the bones of this rather obese individual, had devoured by way of dessert the more outstanding facial features of one of the police— who had tried to deter him from finishing his main course. All this, as before, was done amid the frantic protests of a great throng. After a final nibbling at the scant vestiges of the unfortunate constable's left ear, Nagathan Zorm had seemed to experience a feeling of repletion, and had suffered himself to be led docilely away by the jailers. I and the others who had helped me in the arduous toils of entombment were more than astounded when we heard the news, and the effect on the general public was indeed deplorable. The more superstitious and timid began leaving the city forthwith, and there was much revival of forgotten prophecies, and much talk among the various priesthoods anent the necessity of placating with liberal sacrifice their mystically angered gods and eidolons. Such nonsense I was wholly able to disregard. But, under the circumstances, the persistent return of Nagathan Zorm was no less alarming to science than to religion. We examined the tomb, if only as a matter of form— and found that certain of the superincumbent boulders had been displaced in such a manner as to admit the outward passage of a body with the lateral dimensions of some large snake or muskrat. The sarcophagus, with its metal bolts, was bursten at one end, and we shuddered to think of the immeasurable force that must have been employed in its disruption. Because of the way in which the case overpassed all known biologic laws, the formalities of civil law were now waived, and I, Athamaus, was called upon that same day before the sun had reached its meridian, and was solemnly charged with the office of re-beheading Nagathan Zorm at once. The interment or other disposal of the remains was left to my discretion, and the local soldiery and constabulary were all placed at my command, if I should require them. Deeply conscious of the honour thus implied, and sorely perplexed but undaunted, I went forth to the scene of my labours. When the criminal reappeared, it was obvious to every one that his physical personality, in achieving this new recrudescence, had undergone a most salient change. His motling had developed more than a suggestion of some startling and repulsive pattern. 
and his human characteristics had yielded to the inroads of an unearthly distortion. The head was now joined to the shoulders almost without the intermediation of a neck. The eyes were set diagonally in a face with oblique bulgings and flattenings. The nose and mouth were showing a tendency to displace each other, and there were still further alterations which I shall not specify, since they involved an abhorrent degradation of man's noblest and most distinctive corporeal members. I shall, however, mention the strange, pendulous formations like annulated dewlaps or wattles, into which his kneecaps had now evolved. Nathless, it was Nagathin Zorm himself who stood, if one could dignify the fashion of his carriage by that wood, before the block of justice. Because of the virtual non-existence of a nape, the third beheading called for a precision of eye and a nicety of hand which, in all likelihood, no other headsman than myself could have shown. I rejoice to say that my skill was adequate to the demand made upon it, and once again the culprit was shorn of his vile cephaloid appendage. But if the blade had gone even a little to either side, the dismemberment entailed would have been technically of another sort than decapitation. The laborious care with which I and my assistants conducted the third inhumation was indeed deserving of success. We laid the body in a strong sarcophagus of bronze— and the head in a second but smaller sarcophagus of the same material. The lids were then soldered down with molten metal, and after this the two sarcophagi were conveyed to opposite parts of Camorium. The one containing the body was buried at a great depth beneath monumental masses of stone. But that which enclosed the head I left uninterred proposing to watch over it all night in company with a guard of armed men. I also appointed a numerous guard to keep vigil above the burial place of the body. Night came, and with seven trusty trident bearers, I went forth to the place where we had left the smaller of the two sarcophagi. This was in the courtyard of a deserted mansion amid the suburbs, far from the haunts of the populace. For weapons, I myself wore a short falchion and carried a great bill. We took along a plentiful supply of torches, so that we might not lack for light in our gruesome vigil, and we lit several of them at once and stuck them in crevices between the flagstones of the court in such wise that they formed a circle of lurid flames about the sarcophagus. We had also brought with us an abundance of the crimson foom wine in leathern bottles, and dice of mammoth ivory, with which to beguile the black nocturnal hours. And eyeing our charge with a casual but careful vigilance, we applied ourselves discreetly to the wine, and began to play for small sums of no more than five pezours, as is the want of good gamblers till they have taken their opponent's measure. The darkness deepened apace, and in the square of sapphire overhead, to which the illumination of our torches had given a jetty tinge, we saw Polaris and the red planets that looked down for the last time upon Camorium in her glory. But we dreamed not of the nearness of disaster, but jested bravely and drank in ribald mockery to the monstrous head that was now so securely coffined and so remotely sundered from its odious body. And the wine passed and repassed among us, and its rosy spirit mounted in our brains, and we played for bolder stakes, and the game quickened to a goodly frenzy. I know not how many stars had gone over us in the smoky heavens— nor how many times I had availed myself of the ever-circling bottles, but I remember well that I had won no less than ninety pezours from the trident-bearers, who were all swearing lustily and loudly, as they strove in vain to stem the tide of my victory. I, as well as the others, had wholly forgotten the object of our vigil. The sarcophagus containing the head was one that had been primarily designed for the reception of a small child. 
Its present use, one might have argued, was a sinful and sacrilegious waste of fine bronze, but nothing else of proper size and adequate strength was available at the time. In the mounting fervour of the game, as I have hinted, we had all ceased to watch this receptacle, and I shudder to think how long there may have been something visibly or even audibly amiss before the unwanted and terrifying behaviour of the sarcophagus was forced upon our attention. It was the sudden, loud, metallic clangour, like that of a smitten gong or shield, which made us realise that all things were not as they should have been. And turning unanimously in the direction of the sound, we saw that the sarcophagus was heaving and pitching in a most unseemly fashion amid its ring of flaring torches. First on one end or corner, then on another, it danced and pirouetted, clanging resonantly all the while on the granite pavement. The true horror of the situation had scarcely seeped into our brains, ere a new and even more ghastly development occurred. We saw that the casket was bulging ominously at top and sides and bottom, and was rapidly losing all similitude to its rightful form. Its rectangular outline swelled and curved and were horribly erased, as in the changes of a nightmare, till the thing became a slightly oblong sphere. And then, with a most appalling noise, it began to split at the welded edges of the lid and burst violently asunder. Through the long, ragged rift there poured in hellish abolition a dark, ever-swelling mass of incognizable matter, frothing as with the venomous foam of a million serpents, hissing as with the yeast of fermenting wine, and putting forth here and there great sooty-looking bubbles that were large as pig-bladders. Overturning several of the torches, it rolled in an inundating wave across the flagstones, and we all sprang back in the most abominable fright and stupefaction to avoid it. Cowering against the rear wall of the courtyard, while the overthrown torches flickered wildly and smokily, we watched the remarkable actions of the mass, which had paused as if to collect itself, and was now subsiding like a sort of infernal dough. It shrank, it fell in, till after a while its dimensions began to reapproach those of the encoffined head, though they still lacked any true semblance of its shape. The thing became a round, blackish ball, on whose palpitating surface the nascent outlines of random features were limbed with the flatness of a drawing. There was one lidless eye, tawny, pupilless, and phosphoric, that stared upon us from the centre of the ball, while the thing appeared to be making up its mind. It lay still for more than a minute— then, with a catapulting bound, it sprang past us toward the open entrance of the courtyard, and disappeared from our ken on the midnight streets. Despite our amazement and disconcertion, we were able to note the general direction in which it had gone. This, to our further terror and confoundment, was toward the suburb of Camorium, in which the body of Nagathan Zorm had been entombed. We dared not conjecture the meaning of it all, and the probable outcome. But, though there were a million fears and apprehensions to deter us, we seized our weapons and followed on the path of that unholy head, with all the immediacy and all the forthrightness of motion, which a goodly cargo of foom wine would permit. No one other than ourselves was abroad, at an hour when even the most dissolute revellers had either gone home or had succumbed to their potations under tavern tables. The streets were dark, and were somehow drear and cheerless, and the stars above them were half stifled as by the invading mist of a pestilential miasma. We went on, following a main street, and the pavements echoed to our tread in the stillness with a hollow sound as if the solid stone beneath them had been honeycombed with mausolean vaults in the interim of our weird vigil. In all our wanderings we found no sign of that supremely noxious and execrable thing which had issued from the riven sarcophagus. 
nor to our relief, and contrary to all our fears, did we encounter anything of an allied or analogous nature, such as might be abroad, if our surmises were correct. But, near the central square of Camorium, we met with a number of men carrying bills and tritons and torches, who proved to be the guards I had posted that evening above the tomb of Negathan Zorn's body. These men were in a state of pitiable agitation, and they told us a fearsome tale, of how the deep-hewn tomb and the monumental blocks piled within it had heaved as with the throes of earthquake, and of how a python-shapen mass of frothing and hissing matter had poured forth from amid the blocks, and had vanished into the darkness toward Camorium. In return, we told them of that which had happened during our vigil in the courtyard, and we all agreed that a great foulness, a thing more baneful than beast or serpent, was again loose and ravening in the night. And we spoke only in shocked whispers of what the morrow might declare. Uniting our forces, we searched the city, combing cautiously its alleys and its thoroughfares, and dreading with the dread of brave men the dark, iniquitous spawn on which the light of our torches might fall at any turn or in any nook or portal. But the search was vain, and the stars grew faint above us in a livid sky, and the dawn came in among the marble spires with a glimmering of ghostly silver, and a thin, phantasmal amber was sifted on walls and pavements. Soon there were footsteps other than ours that echoed through the town, and one by one the familiar clangors and clamors of life awoke. Early passers appeared, and the sellers of fruits and milk and legumes came in from the countryside. But of that which we sought, there was still no trace. We went on, while the city continued to resume its matutinal activities around us. Then, abruptly, with no warning, and under circumstances that would have startled the most robust and afraid the most valorous, we came upon our quarry. We were entering the square in which was the Igon block, whereon so many thousand miscreants had laid their piacular necks, when we heard an outcry of mortal dread and agony such as only one thing in the world could have occasioned. Hurrying on, we saw that two wayfarers, who had been crossing the square near the block of justice, were struggling and writhing in the clutch of an unequalled monster, which both natural history and fable would have repudiated. In spite of the baffling, ambiguous oddities which the thing displayed, we identified it as Nagath and Zorm when we drew closer. The head, in its third reunion with that detestable torso, had attached itself in a semi-flattened manner to the region of the lower chest and diaphragm, and during the process of this novel coalescence, one eye had slipped away from all relation with its fellow or the head, and was now occupying the navel just below the embossment of the chin. Other and even more shocking alterations had occurred. The arms had lengthened into tentacles, with fingers that were like knots of writhing vipers, and where the head would normally have been, the shoulders had reared themselves to a cone-shaped eminence that ended in a cup-like mouth. Most fabulous and impossible of all, however, were the changes in the nether limbs. At each knee and hip, they had re-bifurcated into long, lithe proboscides that were lined with throated suckers. By making a combined use of its various mouths and members, the abnormality was devouring both of the hapless persons whom it had seized. Drawn by the outcries, a crowd gathered behind us as we neared this atrocious tableau. The whole city seemed to fill with a well-nigh instantaneous clamour, an ever-swelling hubbub, in which the dominant note was one of supreme, all-devastating terror. I shall not speak of our feelings as officers and men. It was plain to us that the ultramundane factors in Negath and Zorm's ancestry had asserted themselves with a hideously accelerative ratio, 
following his latest resurrection. But despite this, and the holy stupendous enormity of the miscreation before us, we were still prepared to fulfil our duty, and defend as best we could the helpless populace. I boast not of the heroism required. We were simple men, and should have done only that which we were visibly called upon to do. We surrounded the monster, and would have assailed it immediately with our bills and tritons. But here an embarrassing difficulty disclosed itself. The creature before us had entwined itself so tortuously and inextricably with its prey, and the whole group was writhing and tossing so violently that we could not use our weapons without grave danger of impaling or otherwise injuring our two fellow citizens. At length, however, the strugglings and heavings grew less vehement, as the substance and lifeblood of the men were consumed, and the loathsome mass of devour and devoured became gradually quiescent. Now, if ever, was our opportunity, and I am sure we should all have rallied to the attack, useless and vain as it would certainly have been. But plainly the monster had grown weary of all such trifling, and would no longer submit himself to the petty annoyance of human molestation. As we raised our weapons and made ready to strike, the thing drew back, still carrying its vain-drawn flaccid victims, and climbed upon the Igon block. Here, before the eyes of all assembled, it began to swell in every part, in every member, as if it were inflating itself with a superhuman rancor and malignity. The rate at which the swelling progressed, and the proportions which the thing attained as it covered the block from sight and lapsed down on every side with undulating, inundating folds, would have been enough to daunt the heroes of remotest myth. The bloating of the main torso, I might add, was more lateral than vertical. When the abnormality began to present dimensions that were beyond those of any creature of this world— and to bulge aggressively toward us with a slow, interminable stretching of boa-like arms. My valiant and redoubtable companions were scarcely to be censured for retreating. And even less can I blame the general population, who were now evacuating Camorium in torrential multitudes, with shrill cries and wailings. Their flight was no doubt accelerated by the vocal sounds which— for the first time during our observation were being emitted by the monster. These sounds partook of the character of hissings, more than anything else. But their volume was overpowering, their tormbra was a torment and a nausea to the ear. And, worst of all, they were issuing not only from the diaphragmic mouth, but from each of the various other oral openings or suckers which the horror had developed. Even I, Athamaus, drew back from those hissings, and stood well beyond reach of the coiling serpentine fingers. I am proud to say, however, that I lingered on the edge of the empty square for some time, with more than one backward and regretful glance. The thing that had been Nagathenzorm was seemingly content with its triumph— and it brooded supine and mountainous above the vanquished Igon block. Its myriad hisses sank to a slow, minor sibilation, such as might issue from a family of somnolent pythons, and it made no overt attempt to assail or even approach me. But, seeing at last that the professional problem which it offered was quite insoluble— and divining, moreover, that Comorium was by now entirely without a king, a judicial system, a constabulary, or a people, I finally abandoned the doomed city, and followed the others.
If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.